It's been 20 years since the epic fantasy film The Lord of the Rings was released, and its visual effects still remain unmatched. Despite the high scores of the Hobbit trilogy, it couldn't surpass the trilogy's height. The novel took 12 years to write, and four years of repeated revisions and four years of screenwriting. The film was a 20-year accumulation and is considered a Western epic. Earlier, I explained the Hobbit series, and today I will continue to explain the story that follows. To fully understand this magnificent masterpiece, one must first understand the origin of the One Ring. In the beginning of the film, the director clearly explains through narration that before the Dark Lord Sauron tore off his hypocritical mask, he, as a wise man, together with the elves, forged 19 One Rings for the benefit of Middle-earth. Among them, three were made by the elves themselves, seven were given to the dwarven kings, and the remaining nine rings were all given to nine human kings. These rings were infused with powerful magic, and their bearers used them to protect their respective races. However, they did not know that Sauron, in the depths of the Mount Doom volcano, secretly forged a one ring that could control all the other rings. Sauron poured all his cruel and insatiable ambition to control everything into this one ring. The peaceful world of Middle-earth gradually became shrouded in Sauron's darkness. The Elven Queen was the first to realize Sauron's scheme, and they took off their rings. However, the nine human kings were consumed by the power of the one ring and ultimately became Sauron's puppets turning into ring wreaths without physical bodies. To resist Sauron, the Human and Elven Alliance launched a decisive battle against Mordor at the foot of Mount Doom. The Orc army swarmed down the hills, and at Elrond's command, the Golden Armor Army of Elves launched a massive attack on the Orcs with a hail of arrows. The vast armies were about to engage in a frontal battle, and the Elven army immediately switched to melee mode and began to hack and slash at the Orcs. Just as everyone was cheering for the imminent victory, Sauron joined the battle with the One Ring. The allied forces were powerless against the power of the One Ring, and the overwhelming attack suddenly shifted the tide in favor of the orcs. Even the human king was hit by Sauron's hammer and flew off onto the rocks. Killed on impact, the Prince Isildur rushed to his father's side, but Sauron wanted to eliminate them all and leave no chance for escape. At a crucial moment, Prince Isildur picked up his father's broken sword and angrily chopped off Sauron's finger. The One Ring fell to the ground and Isildur noticed it. Sauron, now powerless without the One Ring's strength, emitted a bright white light and disappeared in a big explosion. The shockwave of the explosion knocked down everyone present. Eventually, the allied forces defeated the Mordor army. Isildur picked up the One Ring from the ground to prevent any future risks. Elrond asked Isildur to take the One Ring to the volcano and destroy it. However, when the time came, Isildur was tempted by the One Ring and decided to keep it for himself. On his way home, he was attacked by orcs. In the chaos, Isildur put on the One Ring and instantly became invisible. He took the opportunity to jump into the river and escape the battlefield. In that moment, the One Ring had its own ideas. It chose to betray Isildur and leave him. Without the One Ring's power, Isildur's body was revealed and he was shot to death by arrows in the river. The One Ring sank to the bottom of the river and slept for two and a half thousand years. As time passed, this history evolved into a legend, until a chance encounter. Two hobbits were fishing in the river when one of them jumped into the lake and accidentally found the One Ring. They didn't know the origin of the One Ring, but just a glance at it deeply tempted them. Smeagol, on his birthday, asked his companion to give him the ring as a gift. <sighs> Precious. The two began to fight over the ring, and in the end, Smeagol strangled his own companion to death, and uttered a classic line to the ring. Smeagol used the One Ring's invisibility to return to his home in Shire and did many unsavory things. He was driven out of his home by his people and forced to flee to the caves of Misty Mountains, where he lived by eating raw fish. Due to being corrupted by the One Ring for a long time, Smeagol became a creature that was neither human nor ghost. Without any contact with the outside world, he developed a split personality disorder and often talked to himself while holding the One Ring. He lived quietly in Misty Mountains for 500 years, completely degenerating into a crawling monster. Time made him forget many things, including his own name. Soon after, the One Ring was called by Sauron and chose to leave Gollum. It wanted to return to its master and was found by the Hobbit Bilbo during his adventure. This seamlessly connects with the ending of The Hobbit. Hobbits mainly rely on farming and live on the outskirts of Middle-earth and Shire. They are naturally small, have large feet, and enjoy a peaceful life. They do not like to get involved in the affairs of the world. 
Hobbits cannot compare with dwarves in craftsmanship or with elves in nobility, and they are even far from humans, however, they do not demand much from life. As long as they can have a simple meal and sit on the sofa to enjoy the sunshine in the afternoon, they are satisfied. Because hobbits are so ordinary, Gandalf chose Bilbo as a member of the adventure team. Even though Gandalf knew that the One Ring was in Bilbo's possession on their way back, he did not expose Bilbo's well-meaning lie. The One Ring is better guarded by a hobbit than by any other race. Bilbo returned to Bag End in Shire and held onto the ring for 60 years. It was precisely because hobbits are so ordinary that they do not have any greed. And thus, Bilbo was not consumed by the ring's evil desires. The average lifespan of a hobbit is 100 years, but Bilbo lived to the age of 111, and his mental state remained intact. It is evident that the ring gave him the energy to live until today. Today is Bilbo's 111th birthday, and his old friend Gandalf has come from afar to attend his birthday party. However, he was stopped on his way by a group of children, as no child can resist his dazzling fireworks. In the evening, Bilbo invited everyone in the village to a feast, and fireworks lit up the sky. After three rounds of drinks, Bilbo stood on the stage to make a speech. Little did anyone know that Bilbo had been preparing for this day and planned to quietly put on the one ring in front of everyone and disappear, starting his last journey in life. I'm going now. I bid you all a very fond farewell. This scene surprised everyone present, and Gandalf certainly knew that Bilbo had used the ring's invisibility function, he advised Bilbo not to use the ring lightly and asked him to leave it behind, the journey will still go on. When Bilbo was about to put down the one ring, he hesitated and suddenly became very angry and irritable, he spoke the same words as Gollum did, revealing the ring's hold on him. My precious. Precious? It's been called that before. By you. Ah, what business is it of yours when I do with my own things? I think you've had that ring quite long enough. You want it for yourself? Bravo, Baggins! Do not take me for some conjurer of cheap tricks. I am not trying to rob you. Gandalf used his soul cry to awaken the lost Bilbo, who sensed that there was something wrong with the ring. Once he regained his senses, Bilbo decided to let go of his obsession with the One Ring and entrusted everything to his nephew Frodo, determined to leave the One Ring behind. Bilbo dropped it on the ground and set off with his luggage to spend his remaining years in Rivendell before the day grew late. Gandalf, who also dared not touch the ring's evil power, entrusted it to the protagonist Frodo, sealed it in an envelope, and left without saying a word. Gandalf needed to prove whether the ring was indeed the One Ring, so he went alone to the library in Minas Tirith and searched through a large amount of information. In the end, he found the record that described the creation of the One Ring. According to the record, the One Ring had an anti-counterfeiting function, it would display the text of Mordor when exposed to a temperature of 100 degrees. Gandalf rushed back to Bag End and threw the envelope into the fireplace, as he expected. It was indeed the genuine One Ring, Sauron's physical body had disappeared, but his spirit remained. If the ring was not destroyed, Sauron would still rise again. Meanwhile, Gollum was captured by the orcs, and Mordor interrogated him about the whereabouts of the One Ring. After undergoing severe torture, he finally revealed that the one who picked up the ring was a hobbit living in Shire. Sauron immediately dispatched the Nine Ring Wraiths to Shire to capture the person. The news quickly reached Gandalf who urged Frodo to pack and leave Shire with the ring. He instructed Frodo to wait for him at a nearby inn while he went to seek the advice of the white wizard Saruman in Isengard. All of this conversation was overheard by Sam, the gardener who was pruning the garden outside. To prevent the news from leaking out, Gandalf decided to let Sam accompany Frodo on this adventure. On this journey, Sam became Frodo's best assistant. Gandalf had come to request the assistance of his superior Saruman. However, at a critical moment, Saruman suddenly betrayed the revolution. Gandalf's face showed an expression of helplessness. Without any further words, the two immediately engaged in a fierce fight from a distance. When I was a child, I found this fight scene between Gandalf and Saruman to be very exciting and elegant. However, as I grew up and watched it again, I felt a sense of desolation and distress. Clearly, the grey-robed Gandalf was no match for the white-robed Saruman. When Saruman took Gandalf's staff from him, he had no means to fight back. Saruman used his magic to trap Gandalf at the top of the tower, leaving him with no escape. <laughs> 
At that moment, Frodo sensed a looming sense of darkness and danger ahead. The four of them quickly ran to a nearby tree and hid beneath it. As expected, a ring wraith, dressed in a black robe, approached them, sensing the presence of the One Ring. The four of them remained motionless and held their breath. Afraid to make any sudden movements, Frodo, frightened by the encounter, thought about putting on the ring to disappear. Once the One Ring is used, the ring wraiths can sense its location. Fortunately, Sam stopped Frodo from putting on the ring. Pippin distracted a ring wraith by throwing a piece of bark, allowing the group to escape from daylight into darkness. However, the ring wraith continued to pursue them relentlessly. Finally, the group managed to reach a dock ahead of the ring wraiths and boarded a raft to escape danger. The ring wraiths, who were afraid of water, did not pursue them any further. That night, the sky was filled with flashes of lightning and thunder, accompanied by a fierce storm. Following Gandalf's plan, they made their way to the neighboring village and planned to meet him at an inn. Frodo asked the innkeeper about Gandalf's whereabouts, but he said he hadn't seen the old man with the gray beard for half a year. Gandalf failed to show up at the inn as planned, so the hobbits decided to wait for him while having a drink. However, a mysterious ranger dressed in black watched Frodo closely from a corner of the room. Excuse me. Man in the corner. Who is he? Right, look around here. He's known as Strider. Frodo felt a sense of panic rising within him, and his subconscious urged him to put on the one ring and disappear. However, at a critical moment, Pippin, who may have had a bit too much to drink, accidentally revealed Frodo's surname and identity. Frodo rushed over to Pippin to cover his mouth, but in his haste, he stumbled and accidentally dropped the ring, causing it to slip onto his finger and turn him invisible. Everyone present was shocked by what had just happened. At the same time, the nine ring wraiths felt the call of the one ring and immediately changed direction to head towards the inn Frodo put on the ring and entered the void, where he saw Sauron's eye calling out to the ring, which undoubtedly allowed Sauron to know the ring's location in real time. Frodo, feeling frightened, took off the one ring, however, he was immediately grabbed by a nearby ranger and pushed up against the wall. The ranger warned him not to use the ring again, as the situation was extremely dangerous and he shouldn't wait for Gandalf any longer. The ranger who grabbed Frodo was none other than our other main character, Aragorn. It was Aragorn's ancestor who had cut off Sauron's finger in the past. Aragorn is the 39th direct descendant of Isildur and the only rightful heir to the Kingdom of Gondor. As the last King of Gondor had no children, currently, the Kingdom of Gondor is ruled by the Steward's family, with the Regent holding the power. Aragorn has been living in hiding as a ranger, keeping his true identity and name hidden among the lower classes of Middle-earth. Everyone believed that the bloodline of the Gondor royal family had been completely severed. Aragorn, a close friend of the Grey Wizard Gandalf, was deliberately chosen by Gandalf to protect the Four Hobbits. The Nine Ringwraiths soon arrived at the inn. Thanks to Aragorn's help, the four of them escaped a dangerous situation. Aragorn led them to the elves' territory with a plan to bring them to Rivendell to be handled by Elrond in the One Ring. That night, they decided to stop and rest at a watchtower. While Aragorn went to scout the surrounding area, the three hobbits started a fire to cook some food. Frodo quickly put out the fire when he realized it was attracting attention, but the light had already caught the attention of five ringwraiths. The group quickly drew their swords and prepared for battle as the ringwraiths closed in. With no way out, they summoned their courage and fought for their lives. <laughs> Sam was the first to be knocked unconscious, followed by Pippin and Merry who were pulled away. Frodo dropped his weapon and fell back in fear, tripping over his own feet and landing hard on the ground. As the ring wraiths closed in, Frodo put on the one ring and instantly became invisible. He could see the true form of the ring wraiths, but even while invisible, they could sense him. One of the ring wraiths shoots an arrow at Frodo, hitting him at the critical moment. But just in time, Aragorn charged up with a torch and drove off the five ring wraiths. The Morgul blade of the ringwraiths was poisonous, and if not treated in time, Frodo would become a puppet of Sauron. Aragorn had no choice but to take him to Rivendell to seek the help of Elrond. Along the way, they encountered the daughter of Elrond, a princess of the elves. The elf princess had a dazzling holy light and a fitting background music when she appeared. Frodo. 
Arwen is Aragorn's childhood girlfriend. Frodo is already too weak for the two to be intimate. Arwen decides to take it alone first. Frodo travels to Rivendell to have his father, Elrond, treat him, and still can't avoid Ringwraith's broken pursuit along the way. Arwen made multiple attempts to shake off the ringwraiths in the forest, but no matter how fast her horse ran, they were always in pursuit. The chase went on through the night until they reached a river where the ringwraiths finally stopped in their tracks. It seemed that the ringwraiths were afraid of water and hesitant to cross the river. The elf princess summoned a magical incantation and called forth a massive flood that drowned the five ring wraiths. Frodo, saved by the princess's magic, lay in her arms while Arwen wept for his injuries. Meanwhile, Saruman communicated with Sauron through his crystal ball, and was tasked with building an army of Mordor orcs. They began to chop down trees in Fangorn forests, using them as fuel for their forges to create weapons and armor, to compensate for the orcs' inability to fight during the day. Saruman began experimenting with crossbreeding orcs and goblins. They managed to create a new, more powerful breed of orc, which was dug out of the mud and had to tear off a layer of mucus before emerging. These new orcs, known as Urukai, were an upgrade from their orc predecessors. They were taller and stronger, and better equipped for the invasion of Middle-earth. Frodo was brought to Rivendell by the Elf Princess and was saved by the healing powers of Lord Elrond. However, his wound would never fully heal, and it was always at risk of reoccurring. When Frodo awoke, the first person he saw was Gandalf. He asked Gandalf why he hadn't met him at the inn. And Gandalf explained that he had run into trouble of his own. Saruman had captured him and imprisoned him at the top of Amon Hen. There, Saruman had tried to convince him to join his revolution, but before he could be swayed, the giant eagles from the Misty Mountains had swooped in and rescued him. In Rivendell, Frodo was reunited with his uncle, Bilbo. Without the influence of the One Ring, Bilbo had aged considerably, and Frodo could see the toll that the ring had taken on him. Bilbo was busy writing his adventures in The Hobbit, and Frodo was happy to see him again. As they talked, Frodo couldn't help but feel homesick when he saw Bilbo's map of the Shire. The One Ring has been successfully brought to Rivendell and its mission has been accomplished. What to do with the One Ring is no longer one's concern. Elrond summoned all the races to discuss what to do with the One Ring and how to defend against the coming invasion of the Mordor army, which is the fate of all the people of Middle-earth. Elrond asked Frodo to put the One Ring on the stone table. The first time we saw One Ring, everyone was mesmerized by his magical nature, except Frodo who put down One Ring with a sigh of relief. Boromir, the eldest son of the recently taken Chancellor, was the first to step forward and try to take the One Ring, and Gandalf quickly stopped him with a Mordor spell soul cry. <laughs> Boromir proposed to stay behind and hand over to Gundor to deal with Mordor's army. Aragorn interrupted Boromir's conversation and told him that no one but Sauron could handle the One Ring. Boromir was interrupted by a ranger and felt humiliated. Elf Prince Legolas stood up for Aragorn and told him that Aragorn was the sole heir of the royal family of Gundor and the rightful king, and that it was only logical that Boromir should be loyal to Aragorn. To he disliked it back with a great deal of displeasure. Gondor has no king. Needs no king. Elrond stated that the best thing to do was only to destroy the One Ring, and before he could finish his sentence, the acutely irate dwarves Gimli couldn't wait any longer, and picked up his axe and aimed it at the One Ring, chopping it so hard that the whole thing bounced back to the ground by the power of the One Ring. Obviously weapons cannot destroy the One Ring. One Ring is the lava of the Volcano of Doom casting, can only send it to the Volcano of Doom to destroy it, and the location of the Volcano of Doom happens to be, is the lair of the Eye of the Mordor Sauron. Everyone is not willing to go, no one dare to risk going to die for nothing. In the midst of the Council's debates over the fate of the One Ring, 
Frodo stepped forward and made a bold decision, he volunteered to take on the mission of destroying the ring himself. In fact, Gandalf was the last to see Frodo risk his life again, and Gandalf was the first to come forward to assist Frodo on this adventurous journey, followed by Aragorn, who volunteered to join the party, as well as the elven princes Legolas and dwarves Gimli, and, for the sake of Gondor's glory, Boromir, and, of course, the Anne of course, Frodo's three brothers, the ones he was born with and the ones he died with, the nine One Ring escorts were sort of formed, and before they left, Bilbo presented Frodo with two treasures, which were a spiked sword and a piece of dense silver armor, and as anyone who has watched Hobbit knows, the spiked sword exudes a reminder of the blue glow that is emanating when it encounters the orcs. The origin of this silver armor is a sad thing for Bilbo. When this silver armor was given to him by Thorin to witness his friendship with Bilbo, the silver armor is as light as a feather, invulnerable to knives and spears, and has saved Bilbo's life. But Thorin has left Bilbo forever, and he hopes that the silver armor will protect his nephew on the road to the ring. Frodo just unbuttoned, Bilbo saw one ring extremely excited, he said he still want to take one last good look. After all, Bilbo has been holding the ring for 60 years. Frodo saw Bilbo's strange, and rushed to fasten the button. Inside the dimly lit dungeon, a large number of orcs swarmed, they attacked from all sides. The expedition team, which had just been set up, was besieged by orcs. The nine of them couldn't hold back against the countless orcs, and the orcs emitted ear-piercing noises that sent chills down the spine. Heralding a greater danger approaching them, Boromir asks Gandalf what lies ahead, and Gandalf holds his breath, using his mind to sense the unknown risks ahead. Facing a powerful demon, they have to run away before it's too late, and even Gandalf isn't sure he can defeat Balrog, so they plan to head for Moria's pit to get rid of him. Boromir is the first to arrive at the pit, which is littered with broken bridges and arms, and nearly falls off a cliff, only to be saved by Legolas, who arrives just in time to hold him in his arms. Gandalf asked Aragorn to lead the crowd through the Big Joe Bridge to get rid of the Balrog, because their swords cannot play any role against the Balrog. The remnants of the bridge is very dangerous not only no guardrail, but also everywhere there are broken parts of the bridge. The crowd carefully came to a steep broken bridge. Agile Legolas did not hesitate to be the first one to jump to the opposite side. The rest of the group hesitates as Balrog's red light is approaching, Legolas encourages them to jump over, Gandalf jumps over without hesitation and is caught safely by Legolas, but suddenly there are orcs behind them, shooting arrows at them. This certainly added to their difficulty factor. Legolas responded with an arrow straight to orc's brow. Boromir rushed forward with a grunt as he held Merry and Pippin in his arms. At this point the bridge collapsed partly again and became wider. Legolas encouraged everyone while dealing with orcs Aragorn to pick up Sam, throw him forcefully towards the opposite side, stubborn Gimli says dwarves don't need someone to throw. Luckily Legolas grabbed his beard in time and pulled him back, and it was at this point that Gimli told the others not to grab his beard, at which point the bridge began to collapse partially again, and it was no longer possible to jump across at this distance now that Frodo and Aragorn are still alive. The closer Balrog gets to the stone bridge, the more it shakes, a boulder falls from above, cutting off their retreat, and the bridge begins to crack underneath, soon to be collapsing, with the two men standing on top of it, swaying and tilting back and forth. Aragorn told Frodo to tilt his body forward to wake up the incline, and sure enough, the stone bridge was tilted forward by gravity, and just happened to collide with the opposite stone bridge, and the two of them were able to escape successfully. Balrog's flames were already burning in front of his eyes. Gandalf told the crowd to cross the bridge first and stayed behind to deal with him. Balrog jumped up to reveal his true form, which was huge and huge, and came towards the crowd with his bloody mouth wide open, and it was covered in flames that burned wherever it passed. Balrog belonged to the fallen Maya, which was on the same level as Gandalf, and he was a deserter in a great war thousands of years ago. Thousands of years ago, he deserted a great war, 
hiding in the foothills of Moria for thousands of years until the dwarves were digging in the mountains and accidentally awakened Balrog. Two dwarves kings died at the hands of Balrog. He gathered orcs and trolls, perennially entrenched in Moria, resulting in the loss of the dwarves' home, forcing the dwarves to the lonely mountain. For more on the plot, look at it in conjunction with the Hobbit I've narrated. Gandalf stood alone in the middle of the bridge, facing off against the Balrog. The Balrog rose, flames engulfing its entire body. Flame of Udun, the dark fire. Unyielding, the Balrog refused to retreat and launched a deadly strike at Gandalf. With Glamdring, the sword of the ancient kings, Gandalf shattered the Balrog's fiery blade. Unwilling to back down, the Balrog let out a roar and continued its relentless advance towards Gandalf. Gandalf shatters the stone bridge with his fiat, and Balrog, with a great hissing sound, falls down the cliff together with the broken bridge. Gandalf was about to breathe a sigh of relief when Balrog's whip caught Gandalf's foot and kept pulling. Gandalf's life was hanging by a thread as he gripped the edge of the stone bridge. Frodo was so worried about Gandalf that he tried to run over to save him, but Boromir stopped him with one hand. With the bridge soon to collapse, Gandalf spoke to the expeditionary team. Gandalf fell, so deep that the abyss left us, and the expedition team that lost their captain couldn't accept the truth, and the sadness inside them couldn't be calmed for a long time. Gandalf's involvement in the abyss by Balrog has become a fact, and the crowd's sadness will not be calmed for a long time, but now is not the time to remember Gandalf, and Aragorn asks Legolas to wake everyone up to gather their spirits, if we don't hurry, the Orcs Legions will soon catch up with us, and Aragorn takes up the mantle of expedition leader, leading the group into the territory of the Golden Forest, where Gimli tells Frodo to be on his guard when he arrives, for a terrible elfin sorceress resides here, and a single look at her will result in the elfin sorceress's bewitchment. He stated that he would not be afraid of her, as dwarves had a keen sense of perception, and before he could finish his sentence, he was met with a bow and arrow to the head by an elven guard, and after some negotiation by Aragorn, they were taken to Kara's Galadhan. The rulers of this land are the Queen of the Elves, Galadriel and her husband, and the elves come out with their own dazzling holy light and BGM. Galadriel is the most powerful elf in Middle-earth in terms of mana, Aragorn is Galadriel's grandson, and Galadriel is at least 3,000 years old in terms of age. Everyone who saw her was a little afraid to look at her directly as she could see everything with those eyes. Aragorn just looked up at Galadriel and she knew the expedition had lost Gandalf. Boromir locked eyes with her and suddenly for some reason started to cry. She was clearly talking to everyone and Frodo synchronized to hear Galadriel's other voice. Shire. One who has seen me die. While the crowd is resting, Boromir is having a really hard time sleeping and tells Aragorn that when he and the Queen of the Elves locked eyes, Galadriel mentioned his father, and the imminent demise of the Kingdom of Gondor, but that there is still a glimmer of hope, and that he hopes that after he completes this adventurous quest, Aragorn will be able to return to the Kingdom of Gondor, but Aragorn didn't choose to answer, he just smiled a bit, while everyone is asleep. Galadriel walks slowly past Frodo, awakened, Frodo follows all the way, and the Elf Queen arrives at the spring, where Galadriel fills a bottle of water in a spring pool and pours it into a basin of water for Frodo to come closer to watch. This basin of water can see the future and the past. Frodo saw the brothers Legolas and Sam Pippin, and then his hometown of Sia, the beautiful scenery of Erden Cave. And then suddenly the scene shifted. The harmony of the home was burned by the orcs, who mercilessly preyed on their own compatriots, and those who survived were taken as slaves. The Eye of Sauron suddenly appeared in front of his eyes, and the one ring hanging on his chest was about to be sucked into the water, when Frodo used his great perseverance to grab the one ring back with one hand. Galadriel used her mind to start a conversation with Frodo, telling him that if he couldn't destroy this one ring this time, all the scenes she saw in the water basin would become true. She also told Frodo that someone in the expedition team tried to take the one ring, and that all the members would be devoured by it. And she asked Frodo to give him the one ring. Frodo does not hesitate to take off the one ring, and reaches out to give it to her. Confronted with the one ring, Galadriel stirs up the darkness in her heart, 
In place of a dark lord, you would have a queen! Not dark, but beautiful and terrible as the dawn! Treacherous as the sea! Stronger than the foundations of the earth! All shall love me and despair! Returning to her original form after saying these horrible words, she stated that she had passed the test and had also decided to stay away from the mundane world of Middle-earth. Frodo says he can't destroy one ring on his own, and Galadriel tells him that ring bearers must learn to deal with loneliness, since she was also a one ring bearer, and she was carrying the water ring, one of the three rings of the elves. She understood Frodo's difficulties. Saruman has bred a new species of strong orcs from the mud to make up for the orcs' inability to fight in the sunlight, and after swearing allegiance to Saruman, the strong orcs put on brand new armor and prepare to go out on the battlefield with the goal of capturing the four hobbits alive to take the One Ring. On the other hand, each member of the expedition team received a cloak from the elves, which was hand-stitched by elves and possessed an extremely strong hiding effect, as well as elven compressed cookies, which could fill an adult's stomach with just one bite. Legolas also received elven bows and arrows from Kellen and Trill, the Pippin brothers received elven daggers, Sam received elven rope, and Kellen asked Gimli what he wanted, and Gimli said that he didn't want anything, but only to be able to see one more glimpse of the elven queen's face, and that would make him happy. Eventually, Galadriel gifted three golden hairs to Gimli, and Frodo received the Star of Arendel, which would bring him light on the dark road, and she decided to stay away from the mundane world of Middle-earth. A group of individuals is rowing a small boat downstream along a river, legions of powerful orcs followed all the way up the shore. Legolas and Aragorn spotted the strong orcs tracking along the shore and ordered the group to move forward at a faster pace. They crossed the doors of Durin, the northern border of Gondor, and these two huge statues were the ancestors of Aragorn, and it was evident that the kingdom of Gondor was very prosperous in the old days, and that Aragorn and Boromir, who were also subjects of Gondor, were overwhelmed by the sight of the glory of their ancestors. Passing through the doors of Durin, the group prepared to go ashore to regroup and rest, and Aragorn suggested that instead of continuing along the river, the plan was to go through the woods, over the swamp, and straight to Modo. In the middle of the conversation, he realizes that Frodo and Boromir have disappeared. Boromir faces Frodo alone and loses his mind again, unable to resist the temptation to take advantage of the opportunity to snatch the One Ring and he is very eager to get the power of the One Ring to guard the children of Gondor. Frodo can't beat him, so he has to put on the One Ring and run away invisibly. Boromir doesn't get his way, and falls, and comes back to his senses and feels guilty about what he just did. Frodo. Please, Frodo. What have I done? After taking the One Ring with him, Frodo entered the void, he once again saw the terrible eye of Sauron, and felt that he was about to be devoured by Sauron. He was so scared that he hurriedly took off the One Ring and fell to the ground in the air. He was so scared that he took off the One Ring and fell to the ground. It just so happens that Aragorn finds him, and Frodo never trusts anyone again. Frodo told Aragorn to stay away from him because he knew very well that no one could withstand the temptation of the One Ring. Aragorn swore to protect Frodo's safety, but when he saw the One Ring in Frodo's hand, he couldn't help himself, and when he was about to reach out and touch it, Aragorn closed Frodo's hand and promised him that he'd follow him to the end, until the destruction of One Ring. Although Frodo temporarily puts his heart at ease, he still can't trust the members of the expedition team, and he decides that he wants to go on the mission of destroying One Ring alone, and he instructs Aragorn to take care of the two brothers, Sam and Pippin. Suddenly, Aragorn rose and drew his sword, and the spiked sword in Frodo's hand glowed blue, signaling that the orcs had arrived, and he told Frodo to make haste, while he himself stayed behind to break off the rear. Aragorn took up his sword and faced the legions of strong orcs alone, 
who hissed at him and provoked him, but Aragorn was undaunted. He fights and distracts the strong orcs, and Gimli and Legolas quickly come to Aragorn's aid. At this time, the strong orcs sent another way to look for Hobbit. Frodo hid under the tree was found by the two brothers Pippin. Pippin told him to hurry over to escape with them. At this time Frodo has made up his mind to complete the mission alone. For Frodo's safety, the two brothers rushed out to distract the strong orcs. But they were soon surrounded by the enemy. At a crucial moment, Boromir arrives just in time to rescue them. The sound of the horn signaled that Boromir was in immediate danger, and Legolas and Aragorn quickly ran in the direction of the horn, with Aragorn being intercepted by powerful orcs along the way, and the horn urging him to make quick work of the foes in front of him. Boromir called for backup as he fought, telling the two hobbits to run first while he stayed behind to break the back. Boromir was fighting alone and in crisis, when the leader of the strong orcs was slowly coming towards him, drawing his bow full of arrows and aiming them straight at Boromir's heart. He gave his life in order to rescue the two hobbits, and instead of falling weakly, he got up again with difficulty and continued his attack on the enemy. But the strong orc, not being a man of martial virtues, continued to make up another arrow to Boromir. The arrow strikes true, causing him to fall to his knees, witnessing the hobbit on the verge of being captured by the savage orcs. However, Boromir cannot bear to die without putting up a fight. For the glory of Gundor, he chooses to make a noble sacrifice, summoning his last ounce of strength. He valiantly dispatches the two enemies standing before him. Until the third arrow strikes, he can no longer hold on. Falling to his knees, Pippin and Merry are seized by the orcs and taken away. Fortunately, Saruman's command to the orcs is to capture them alive. As he is unaware of which hobbit possesses the One Ring, Boromir could only watch as his companions were taken. He had done all he could, and the strong orcs were about to kill them all before they left. Just as they drew their bows and arrows to strike, Aragorn came flying in and tackled orcs to the ground, and in the area of strength the strong orc held the advantage. Aragorn is slammed hard into a tree, followed by a shield straight into Aragorn's neck. Fortunately, the groove in his shield proves to be his salvation, deflecting the lethal strike. However, the orcs show no mercy and relentlessly swing their weapons at Aragorn, seeking to overpower him. He took the dagger out of his foot and plunged it into the strong orc's leg. The intense pain stirred the strong orc to fury. He drew the dagger from his foot and was about to strike at Aragorn, who sharply blocked the fatal blow. Getting up again with difficulty, he continued to wrestle at the strong orc, having mastered its weakness of slow movement. This time he speeds up his attack and cuts off the strong orc's arm, and in the process, he stabs him through the body. The strong orc is still trying to die with Aragorn, and Aragorn pulls out his saber and cuts off the strong orc's head straight away. The orcs had all withdrawn, and Aragorn ran hastily to Boromir, who, in his dying moments, confessed to Aragorn that he had failed to protect Hobbit. Aragorn comforts Boromir by saying that you have fought bravely, that you have upheld the honor and dignity of Gundor, and finally confesses everything to Aragorn, that he is willing to follow Aragorn as his vassal, and he recognizes Aragorn as the leader of Gundor, the king of Gundor. Aragorn sends Boromir off with tears in his eyes. The same scenario again, he didn't survive the first movie after all, and in the power trip, he's just as likely to not survive the first one either. Frodo looks at the One Ring in his hand and is deep in thought. He really wishes that the One Ring wasn't in his hands, but then he thinks of Gandalf's sacrifice for the expedition and is determined to destroy the One Ring. Frodo decides to embark on the expedition alone, and the simple and honest Sam follows in haste, promising Gandalf that he will do whatever it takes to follow Frodo and share the responsibility with him. Instead of stopping the boat, Frodo picked up speed. He didn't want to drag Sam into the adventure with him. Sam didn't care so much and headed straight for deeper water. Even if you can't swim, you don't want to give up. Sam! His body had completely sunk to the bottom of the lake. Along with the sunlight slowly and gradually dimming, Sam was about to be suffocated. A small handful of hope tightly pulling him up slowly, heralding Sam's new life again. I made a promise, Mr. Frodo. A promise. 
Don't you leave him, Samwise Gamgee. I don't mean to. This is not only the oath that Sam promised to Gandalf, but also reflects the friendship between Sam and Frodo, with Sam as the best assistant. I think it should be smoother in the next road. Boromir lay in the boat with his sword clenched in both hands. It was Aragorn who had arranged a simple funeral for him, and his body disappeared with the waterfall as it flowed straight down the rapid river, and Legolas motioned to the crowd to hasten to follow Frodo and Sam. Aragorn says that none of US can help Frodo and decides to give up on following the expedition to destroy One Ring. Kimli says the expedition team has been a total failure, and tells everyone to split their bags and leave quickly. Aragorn stated that the mission was not complete. And the three decided to catch up with Orcs group to rescue the other two hobbits. Frodo and Sam stood on a high mountain looking up in the direction of Mordor, and the risks ahead for the expedition without others to protect them must have been even more difficult to travel than before. On the road ahead. Saruman is giving an impassioned pre-war speech. A great battle is about to take place. In an instant, the legion of orcs beneath his tower stirred up a cacophony of excitement. They were restless, eager to invade the world of Middle-earth. Simultaneously, Saruman forged an alliance with Sauron through a crystal ball, and the Twin Towers alliance was poised for action. Barad-dur, situated near Mount Doom, held Sauron's malevolent eye atop its pinnacle. Barad-dur and Saruman's orthanc were collectively known as the Twin Towers. Formidable and ominous, the colossal gates of Mordor, weighing thousands of tons, slowly creaked open, while the Mordor army embarked toward the kingdom of Rohan. Meanwhile, another orc legion sped through Rohan's borders on a mission to deliver two recently captured hobbits to the white-robed wizard, Saruman. Meanwhile, the Prince of Elves and the others are picking up the pace to keep up with the orcs. Their goal was to rescue the hobbits before the orcs reached Isengard. The orcs, catching a whiff of their presence, quickened their pace. Legolas isn't catching up with orcs. After three days and nights of running, they couldn't hold on any longer and decided to rest for the night by the forest of Fangorn. The orcs had not consumed food or water during this time, and hunger had sparked descent among them. Some orcs got hungry and suggested swallowing the two hobbits, which resulted in a sudden outbreak of infighting. Pippin and Merry took advantage of the chaos to devise an escape plan. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys! Just as the orcs were about to descend upon them, a spear impaled one of the orcs from behind. The sound of horses' hooves came from the distance, and a regiment of cavalry marched right into the orcs' ranks. They were so brave and well-equipped that they wiped out the orcs in no time at all. Legolas, observing the celestial movements, suspected that last night had seen bloodshed. And sure enough, the cavalry came at them last night. Aragorn, no longer in hiding, stepped forward and called for a halt. What news from the he wished to inquire about the two hobbits. Suddenly, the cavalry encircled them. The captain of the cavalry questioned their purpose for trespassing Rohan's borders. Gimli, a dwarf, responded with defiance. I would cut off your head, dwarf, if it stood but a little higher from the ground. You would die before your stroke fell. But Aragorn intervened to defuse the tension. The cavalry captain introduced them as the cavalry of the Kingdom of Rohan. King Rohan had been under Saruman's control for a long time and had become a corrupt ruler, and because they had been compelled by the mutinous military around them, they were banished and sent to the borders of the Kingdom of Rohan. Then they told Aragorn that they had destroyed a legion of orcs last night and left none alive. They piled up the bodies of all the orcs and set them on fire. Before they left, they gave them two fast horses and rushed off. The trio swiftly reached the battlefield from the previous night to search for clues about the hobbits. They found a hobbit's belt, and sorrow gripped their hearts. <coughs> While Aragorn was blaming himself for not protecting Hobbit, he found traces of them on the ground. The clues revealed that they were not dead but had broken into the dreaded forest of Fangorn. Pippin and Merry were unaware of the dangers of the forest. The trees here have survived in the forest of Fangorn for thousands of years, moving and communicating in their own language when in danger. Soon Pippin and Merry were captured by the tree spirits. As the forest of Fangorn is constantly being cut down by the orcs, 
the tree spirits are not sure if they are related to the orcs, so it planned to hand the two hobbits over to the white wizard for judgment. When they heard about the white robe sorcerer, they knew it was Saruman. Meanwhile, the three of them enter the forest of Fangorn to look for the hobbits. Legolas keenly heard the trees conversing with each other, and danger was slowly approaching them. They took up their weapons and stood at the ready. The white-robed sorcerer blocked all the attacks of the three without any effort. A white light shone directly into their faces, and they couldn't see if the person in front of them was friend or foe. Who are you? Show yourself! The blinding white light slowly dispersed, and the crowd finally saw that it was Gandalf. Gandalf's appearance left them so excited that they couldn't even speak. He had not only survived but had advanced to become a white wizard. According to Gandalf's account, after he and the Balrog fell into the abyss together, they engaged in a life-and-death battle in the void. They fought relentlessly for three days and three nights, eventually ascending to the endless steps that led to the highest peak of the Misty Mountains. It was on the mountaintop that Gandalf defeated the Balrog, but he was extremely weakened and seemed on the brink of death. However, instead of fading away, Gandalf's soul was directly transported to the presence of Iliavator, beyond the universe. Iliavator bestowed greater power upon Gandalf and sent him back to Middle-earth to continue his unfinished mission. Gandalf stepped into the role of the fallen Saruman and was promoted to become a white wizard. He had arranged for the Treebeard to send the two hobbits back to the Shire. Gandalf learned that Saruman was going to start with the Kingdom of Rohan. The four of them decided to go to the Kingdom of Rohan together to remind them to prepare their defenses. After a grueling journey of three days and three nights, they finally reached the Kingdom of Rohan. King Theoden was under Saruman's control and had fallen into a state of confusion and delirium. As Gandalf entered the Great Hall, he sensed a dark presence and concealed his identity by wearing his grey cloak. Grima sensed that Gandalf meant trouble and quickly ordered the guards to apprehend them, but Legolas and Aragorn swiftly overpowered them. Gandalf, with determined steps and his staff in hand, approached the king. Gandalf softly chanted an incantation, attempting to break the spell that bound King Theoden. Suddenly, Theoden mocked and taunted Gandalf, claiming that the Grey Wizard posed no threat to him. In response, Gandalf removed his grey cloak, and a radiant light illuminated the entire hall. Using his staff, Gandalf forcibly expelled Saruman's influence from the possessed King Theoden. Theoden's pale face gradually regained its color, and his consciousness returned. Grima was banished from the Kingdom of Rohan, with a major battle looming. King Theoden immediately ordered the mobilization of his forces to defend his people and instructed everyone to relocate to the Helm's Deep Pass. This fortress, with its towering stone walls reaching a hundred meters high, had guarded the safety of Rohan for generations and was known as the Impregnable City. Gandalf told Aragorn to escort the Rohan people to Helm's Deep. He went to gather the scattered Rohan knights for support. Gandalf and Aragorn agreed to meet at Helm's Deep when the first light of the fifth day appeared. The next day the king and Aragorn set out on the road with the old, the weak and the children, but word soon reached Saruman. Saruman who sent his ward cavalry to ambush the Rohan expedition. King Theoden ordered the elderly, women, and children to move ahead while he and his warriors remained to confront the enemy. Legolas was the first to unleash a barrage of arrows against the wargs. The ward cavalry swarmed in large numbers. By now, his teammates were arriving, and Legolas jumped lightly onto Gimli's horse Gimli's horse and charged with them. Aragorn fought fiercely, dispatching several warg, but suddenly, one of the warg lunged at him from behind, and another attacked from the front. Aragorn managed to slay the orcs on his back but was trapped by the warg's reins. Warg runs too fast to break and Aragorn and warg fall off the cliff together. After the battle, Legolas stood at the edge of the cliff searching for Aragorn, but his body had been washed away by the rushing waters, and his fate remained uncertain. There was no time for grief. As now was not the moment to mourn Aragorn, they hastened their pace to reach Helm's Deep. After much effort, they finally reached the fortress. A battle between man and beast is about to start in Helm's Deep. Mercenary takes mammoth through the borders of the Kingdom of Rohan. These massive mammoths were formidable in battle, and the three hobbits had never witnessed such a spectacular display of military might. Just as they marveled at the sight, the mercenaries fell victim to an ambush by an unidentified group. 
resulting in the swift demise of all the mercenaries. Realizing the danger, the hobbits attempted to escape, but they were captured by the ambushers and taken to their camp. It turned out that these ambushers were aware of Sauron's plans for a major war and, as humans, they felt a responsibility to protect Middle-earth. Frodo told him everything, when he mentioned Boromir's death. One of the men grew visibly anxious, turns out he's Boromir's brother and the second son of the regent, Chancellor of Gondor, named Faramir. The regent, however, was particularly fond of his eldest son, Boromir was a strong leader in Gondor, and the regent had long since made Boromir his heir. Faramir's fate was far different from his brother's, no matter how hard he tried, he was never recognized by his father, so he always wanted to prove himself. At that time, Elrin called a meeting of all the races, Faramir wanted to go along, but the regent never gave him the chance. The regent thought he could only be comfortable with Faramir's brother going on this mission. Faramir would have to defend the fortress for the rest of his life. Faramir, upon seeing the one ring around Frodo's neck, desired to seize the ring and present it to his father to earn his approval. As Faramir was about to make his move, Samwise stepped forward and persuaded him. Your brother almost fell to the temptation of the one ring, but in the end, he sacrificed himself to protect our expedition, he upheld his oath and honor with his life. How can you live up to your brother's behavior now? Faramir was filled with guilt upon hearing these words and decided to honor his brother's wishes by letting them go. Suddenly, Frodo sensed the call of the ring wraiths, and everyone began to prepare for the danger, seeking cover. Frodo suddenly became physically uncontrollable and slowly walked out. He was so seduced by Ringwraith that he couldn't help but want to wear the One Ring. Samwise, disregarding the danger, rushed forward to stop Frodo's actions. In a corner, Faramir used his bow and arrows to drive the Ringwraith away from the city walls. With tears in his eyes, Samwise reflected that they should not be bearing such great risks. After regaining their composure, they set out on their expedition once more. On another front, Aragorn had fallen off a cliff and drifted in the river for three days and nights. Perhaps the prayers of the elf princess helped Aragorn to survive the dangerous period. His loyal horse eventually found him and carried him to Helm's Deep, where he reunited with the rest of the group. While on his journey, Aragorn spotted the orc army already marching toward Helm's Deep. He quickened his pace and hurried back to the Helm's Deep Fortress. Gimli the dwarf was so excited to hear of his good brother's safe return that he couldn't help but hug Aragorn. The news of Aragorn's return was a huge boost to morale. Aragorn promptly informed King Theoden of the information he had gathered during his journey. He told the king that the orc army would arrive at Helm's Deep that very night, urging him to make immediate preparations for the impending battle. King Theoden expressed his fearlessness towards the orc army, as they had impregnable fortress walls that would never fall. This stronghold was as steadfast as a rock. Easy to defend and difficult to conquer, King Theoden expressed that if the estate was lost, it could be replanted, and if houses collapsed, they could be rebuilt. As long as the walls did not fall, he would stand against Saruman until the end. Aragorn argued that the orcs had a much larger purpose in mind, which was to bring destruction to all of Middle-earth. He proposed that King Theoden should seek aid from other races to bolster their defense. However, Theoden had lost faith in alliances with the elves and dwarves, believing that their past alliances had crumbled. Aragorn said that Gundor would honor the Oath of Alliance, but after many orc attacks and no support, King Theoden no longer believes in alliances. Tonight, the fight was inevitable. King Theoden decided to hide the old, the weak and the children in the cellars. The rest of the people armed themselves. Despite having limited time to prepare and inadequate weaponry, old men and children were about to join in the brutal battle. Soon, the orc army arrived at Helm's Deep, and King Theoden donned his battle attire. It was clear that 300 men against 10,000 orcs had no chance of victory. Suddenly the door whistle blew. The elves have not forgotten their oath of alliance. They arrived with a formidable army of 5,000 warriors clad in golden armor. Fulfilling their commitment, Aragorn was thrilled to see his good brother come to his aid and went up to him and embraced him. They were now prepared for the imminent arrival of the orc army. This is one of the most iconic night battles in cinematic history. The Battle of Helm's Deep raged on for a grueling three days and nights. Every shocking shot makes your blood boil. Human and elven forces have gathered atop the city walls. Ready to strike, the orc horde is only 500 meters away from the battlefield. As the enemy draws near, the tension thickens. Everyone holds their breath, standing firm and resolute. Fear forgotten in this moment. 
for behind them lie countless loved ones in need of protection, suddenly, thunder rumbles through the sky, and a torrential rain begins to fall, adding gravity to the impending battle. Even those hiding in the cellar feel the oppressive weight of the impending conflict. Tens of thousands of well-equipped orcs have arrived on the battlefield. The human supreme commander, Aragorn, delivers a rousing pre-battle speech to his warriors. With a thunderous roar from the Orsish general, the battle commences. At Aragorn's command, both elves and humans rain down arrows upon the enemy. The orcs surge toward the city walls like an unstoppable tide. Aragorn orders a second volley of arrows to thin the enemy's front lines. Well-equipped orcs retaliate with crossbows, before the men on the walls can react. Orcs rapidly raise ladders to scale the walls. Aragorn commands his forces to switch to close combat mode. Orcs begin to breach the defenses, making their way onto the walls. The battle came so unexpectedly that Rohan didn't even have a decent defense. They have no choice but to engage in brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. In moments, the wall is filled with the sound of death, and bodies pile up on both sides. Dwarf Gimli engages in a gruesome contest of beheading orcs with Legolas. I'm on 17! Meanwhile, orcs below continue to climb the walls. Orcs employ a second front, launching an attack on another section of the wall. They set up a shield formation to take the gate through the catwalk. Aragorn immediately orders a shift in focus to defend this breach. Under the cover of the shield formation orcs manage to get the siege hammers to the gate of the wall. If the gate falls, all defenses will crumble. The only advantage they have is the stone wall, which is said to never fall. However, Saruman has already identified the wall's fatal flaw. They discreetly placed a team to plant explosives near the drainage system. Aurukai ignites the explosives, rushing toward the sewer. Aragorn notices this suspicious act and quickly has Legolas shoot him down with arrows, even with several arrows piercing his body. The Urukai's determination does not waver, he leaps and ignites the explosives, causing a violent explosion that rocks the earth. The sturdy wall is blasted open, creating a massive breach. Countless orcs pour through the breach, led by Aragorn. Elven archers swiftly transition to close combat. They bravely rush to hold the breach. Legolas uses a shield as a makeshift sled to quickly reach Aragorn's side. With a flurry of arrows, Legolas single-handedly takes down dozens of orcs. The battle exacts a heavy toll on both sides, lasting for an extended period. Despite their exhaustion, both sides persevere. The battering ram relentlessly strikes the gate, and it eventually gives way, to alleviate the pressure on the defenders at the gate. Aragorn and Gimli sneak in for a surprise attack. Aragorn tosses Gimli onto the bridge and follows closely behind. The two of them took out a large wave of orcs with their superior fighting skills. On the other side, orcs use ropes to pull up a ladder, allowing them to ascend the wall. Legolas swiftly takes aim, precisely hitting the rope. The unbalanced ladder crashes down into the orcs below. More and more enemies breach the wall, and the defenders are unable to stop them. They are forced to retreat into the inner keep and close the gate behind them. Inside, elderly and vulnerable Rohan citizens huddle together, prepared for the worst. King Theoden does not want the kingdom of Lohan to fall. He decides to lead a final, glorious charge for the kingdom, willing to sacrifice everything for its honor. They regrouped put on their armor and prepare to meet the enemy. Gimli sounds the horn for the charge. King Theoden charges ahead, with his soldiers following closely behind. In moments, all orcs standing on the path are knocked to the ground. Rohan's generals will only fall in the way of the charge. Defending their last glory with life and blood, defending their families behind them, while everyone was still fighting to kill the enemy. The white-robed wizard Gandalf charged forth with the first rays of dawn. In the radiant light, Gandalf appeared like a savior descending from the heavens. Everyone in the battle seemed to see hope in him. Gandalf, accompanied by scattered horsemen, arrived just in time to provide support. With a commanding shout, 5,000 troops surged forward, fighting for the people of Rohan and their king. As they advanced, bathed in the morning sun, they struck at the enemy. The orcs immediately turned to meet the enemy. In the sunlight, the orcs appeared extremely vulnerable. Gandalf, leading the charge with a staff in one hand and a sword in the other, 
forgot his identity as a wizard and dove into the midst of the enemy without hesitation. On the other hand, Pippin and Merry were sent back to Char by the Tree Spirits. The Tree Spirit then sees that the once lush forest has been cut down by Saruman, those were its family and old friends for years. The Tree Ant let out a furious cry, summoning all their kin. The forest rustled as messages were exchanged and they assembled for battle. They intended to make Saruman pay in blood for what he had done and to lay siege to his stronghold in Isengard. The Treants first attacked the Isengard orcs with massive stones from a distance. After depleting one wave, they swiftly scaled the city walls and entered Isengard to engage in combat. Facing the towering and formidable Treants, the orcs seemed like ants. Crushing punches and kicks gave orcs no chance to fight back, but soon orcs countered with a rope and the fallen tree man was felled by orcs with an axe. The remaining tree ants swiftly hurled massive stones to aid their companions. Saruman can only watch from his tower as the tree men destroy Isengard. The orcs quickly found the tree huggers Achilles' heel and burned them one by one with their fire attacks. As the orcs continue to use their fire attacks to their advantage, the tree goblins on the other side of the river destroy the dam. The rushing floodwaters broke through, directly flooding Isengard. The tree men used their rooted form to stabilize themselves, and the ones that were set on fire used this opportunity to put out the fire. Unable to escape in time, all the orcs were swept away by the floodwaters, and they were carried into the armory. The forges, where weapons were still being manufactured, were also drowned. <laughs> Back at Helm's Deep, they fought from dawn until daybreak. The Rowan forces were invigorated and fought even more fiercely. After their valiant efforts, victory was within sight. The Orc Horde realized that their cause was lost and chose to retreat. In a flash, they scattered like birds and beasts, discarding their armor and fleeing toward an ancient forest. Gandalf ordered everyone to halt and not pursue. The routed Orc army sought refuge in the perilous forest of Fangorn. Little did the Orcs know of the long-suppressed wrath of the tree people that awaited them. After a chorus of wails, the Orcs were all devoured by the tree ants. In the end, humanity triumphed over the darkness, defending Middle-earth, but at a heavy cost. After the great battle, Dwarves Gimli and Legolas proudly announced their respective achievements. Gimli claimed that he was seated atop the 43rd orc's head. Legolas promptly shot an arrow at an orc who hadn't quite perished yet. 43. He was already dead. He was twitching. He was twitching? Cause he's got my axe embedded in his nervous system! Saruman, atop the tower, understood that the situation was against him. Without delay, he swiftly packed his belongings preparing to flee Isengard. In an instant, the orcs on the ground were submerged by the floodwaters. Both sides of the two towers had achieved perfect victories. The Battle of Helm's Deep had come to an end. Gandalf knew that the Dark Lord Sauron would not give up easily. He declared that the war to defend Middle-earth had only just begun. Ahead lay the pouring forth of Sauron's dark forces, directly targeting the greatest and oldest human city in Middle-earth Gondor. The impending Gondor battle that would shake all of Middle-earth to its core. <laughs> Today we continue with the final chapter of The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. In the last episode, we talked about the Battle of Helm's Deep, where Rohan and the Elven Alliance won a perfect victory. Meanwhile, Saruman's stronghold in Isengard was also destroyed by the Ents, and Frodo and Samwise, guided by Gollum, continued their perilous journey to Mount Doom to complete the mission of destroying the One Ring. After the Great Battle, Gandalf led a group of individuals to Isengard. Saruman, now controlled by the Ents, was trapped in a high tower. When Saruman saw Gandalf ascend to become the White Wizard, he seated with anger and immediately launched a fiery attack with his staff. However, the Gandalf of today had developed immunity to fire-based attacks. Gandalf retaliated with his mental powers, shattering Saruman's staff, leaving him powerless. The treacherous Grima, witnessing the arrival of King Theoden, felt overwhelming guilt. Knowing that Theoden would not easily forgive him, contrary to expectations, Theoden, a king who loved his people as his own children, was willing to accept Grima back if he abandoned Saruman. Unfortunately, Grima received a brutal beating from Saruman. While the people are still negotiating, Grima takes a dagger from her back and stabs Saruman several times. Legolas, the elven prince, swiftly shot arrows to stop Grima, but it was too late to save Saruman's life. Saruman fell from a towering spire, impaled on a windmill. 
Accompanied by a magical communication device known as the Palantir, this crystal ball is the magical communication device for Saruman and Sauron to communicate with each other. Its magical powers were not within everyone's control. At night, Legolas looked into the sky and saw that the stars had been darkened, the dark clouds to the east are stirring, and it seems that Sauron's dark forces are beginning to have a motive. Late at night, after everyone had gone to sleep, Pippin's curiosity got the better of him and he took the crystal ball from Gandalf's arms. Pippin wanted to experience the mysteries held within the crystal ball for himself. As he carefully touched and explored the Palantir, Sauron's eye suddenly appeared before him. Extracting all the information, including Frodo's plan to destroy the One Ring, Pippin's expression turned agonized, and he briefly lost consciousness. Aragorn hears the commotion from outside and rushes to stop it, but he is also unable to control the magic power of the crystal ball and faints on the spot. Gandalf, awakened, quickly covers the crystal ball with his coat to put an end to the drama. When Pippin regained consciousness, he immediately told Gandalf that he had a vision of the sacred tree of Gundor withering in the city of Gundor in flames. Gandalf realized that Sauron's next target was Gundor, the core of Middle-earth's alliance. If Gundor fell, there would be no way to rally all the races of men. Gandalf proposed that King Theoden send troops to aid Gundor immediately, but Theoden staunchly refused. He cited the lack of Gundor's support during the Battle of Helm's Deep as the reason. Gandalf, unable to argue further, decided to take Pippin with him to the capital of Gundor. They need to get word to the region of Gundor before Sauron sends his troops, so they can get the alliance assembled and ready for war. In the Lord of the Rings series, the One Ring was once held by these three hobbits, with Gollum being the longest-lasting bearer. He relied on the One Ring's invisibility power to eavesdrop on the people of the Shire and Char and steal from them. Eventually, Gollum was driven out of Char and hid in the Misty Mountains, where he survived for 500 years, gradually transforming into a creature neither fully human nor entirely ghost-like. After 500 years, the One Ring betrayed Gollum and left him. Bilbo came across the One Ring during an adventure and became its possessor, Bilbo. Using the power of the One Ring, aided Thorin and the dwarves in reclaiming the Lonely Mountain, he held the ring for 60 years, demonstrating the Hobbit's remarkable resistance to its corrupting influence. That's why Gandalf gave Frodo the task of destroying the One Ring, together with his loyal gardener Samwise. Frodo embarked on the perilous journey to destroy the ring. However, their journey was far from smooth. They encountered various challenges, including treacherous terrain, inclement weather, and the need to camp out in the wilderness. Despite the hardships, the hobbits endured without complaint, displaying their resilience and determination. One misty morning, as they ventured through the mountains, they realized that someone had been trailing them. At night, they pretended to be asleep to lure the pursuer into revealing himself. And sure enough Gollum came slowly towards them behind him, and he longed for one ring to come back to him again. When Gollum attempted to take the ring from Frodo, a struggle ensued. Frodo swiftly drew the sting sword, a gift from Bilbo, and pointed it at Gollum's throat. Gollum recognized the elven blade and feared it. Haven't you, Gollum? Using elven rope, Frodo bound Gollum. Samwise suggested that Gollum be tied up and thrown down the mountain, but Gollum swore loyalty to the ring's master. Moved by compassion, Frodo spared Gollum's life. Gollum had been captured by Sauron and escaped so he must have remembered the way to the base of the volcano. So Frodo decided to leave Gollum behind to help them lead the way. Gollum proposed a shortcut through the Dead Marshes, a place where humans and elves had waged their first war against Sauron. Thousands of years old remains of the Fallen still littered the area, while ghostly flames continued to burn along the sides of the road. Gollum cautioned them to be extremely cautious with each step. Suddenly Frodo is involuntarily captivated by the body in front of him, and his entire body falls into the swampy lake. He saw the dead soul of orcs asking for the One Ring. In a panic, Gollum pulled Frodo back to safety. Don't follow the lights. Later that night, they heard the eerie cries of the Ringwraiths. Frodo sensed that the Ringwraiths were being drawn to the One Ring. Samwise quickly hid Frodo in a concealed spot, before Ringwraith were drowned by the Elf Princess Flood. But they not only didn't die, but also advanced to become Ghost Riders. They circled above the marshes, and the creatures emitted eerie noises in an attempt to lure them out. Gollum warned the others not to make any sound. After a lengthy search, 
the ringwraiths departed from the marshes, Gollum urged them to continue and reach the border of Mordor that night. After a rugged journey, they finally saw the Black Gate of Mordor, but the trumpets of Mordor were sounding loudly, and the gates were slowly being pulled open by the two giants. Massed legions of orcs are gathering to march on the Kingdom of Rohan, it was evident that a great battle was imminent. To reach Mount Doom, they had to pass through this gate. Suddenly, a loose stone under Samwise's foot gave way, and it tumbled down the slope. Ignoring the danger, Frodo rushed down to rescue Samwise. The falling dust was noticed by mercenaries nearby, just as the mercenaries come forward to observe. Frodo quickly hides them with his elven cloak and escapes. With the gate about to close, they rushed forward, but Gollum pulled them back. Gollum proposed an alternative path that would bypass Mordor and lead them directly to Mount Doom. However, this path was fraught with dangers and challenges. To fulfill their mission, Frodo decided to let Gollum lead the way. Samwise insults Gollum along the way, and Frodo gets upset. Frodo believed that Samwise should not treat their companion in such a harsh manner. Samwise warned Frodo that Gollum could turn against them at any moment. It was only a matter of time. Frodo, on the other hand, argued that Samwise could never truly understand what the One Ring had done to Gollum. Despite the ring having been separated from Gollum for a time, it continued to torment his body. Both being ring bearers, Frodo empathized with Gollum's pain and believed he could help Gollum find redemption, despite their differences. Samwise's unwavering commitment was to protect Frodo above all else. They had a little disagreement. Gollum is degraded in size but still cunning and perceptive. He also senses a breakdown in their relationship and plans to sow discord between them so that Samwise can leave the expedition and he can reclaim the One Ring. Gollum takes a break midway through to hunt and be constantly ingratiating with Frodo, making Frodo feel that Samwise is a redundant presence. In The Lord of the Rings, many people wonder why Frodo and Samwise chose to go through the Misty Mountains instead of taking a more spacious route directly to Mount Doom. There are two main reasons for this choice. Firstly, Sauron's eye constantly surveilled every corner of Middle-earth, and walking on the plains would surely not escape his gaze. Secondly, Sauron knew that the One Ring had fallen into the hands of hobbits. He sent the Nine Ringwraiths to track them and deployed orc armies across the land to search for them. There's no doubt they chose the Misty Mountains to avoid Sauron. One critical incident that influenced their decision was when Gollum led them on a shortcut through the Dead Marshes, and the Ringwraiths appeared in the sky. Circling ominously, this proved that the planes were more likely to give them away. So they changed course for the night and headed back to the Misty Mountains. Gollum led Frodo and Samwise all the way to Barad-dûr, Sauron's stronghold in Mordor. The atmosphere around it was eerie and terrifying, and in order to reach Mount Doom, they had to enter Mordor. Gollum decided to guide them around Barad-dûr and take a hidden, steep staircase into Mordor to avoid detection. Suddenly, the One Ring resonated with Sauron, causing Frodo to uncontrollably move toward the main gate. Fortunately, Samwise and Gollum managed to pull him back in time. The ground started shaking, and a green light shot up from Barad-dûr, visible even in the distant city of Gundor. Everyone in the distant city of Gundor saw it too. Frodo's condition worsened as they approached Mount Doom. As the One Ring's influence over him intensified, they had no choice but to hide behind rocks and assess the situation. The Witch King of Anmar, the leader of the Ring Wraiths, stood on a winged creature above the gate, emitting a chilling and discomforting sound. With a roar from the dragon, legions of orcs poured out of the gates of Barad-dûr. These legions include not only orcs, but also southern human mercenaries who have succumbed to Sauron. Middle-earth was on the brink of an epic battle, and they couldn't afford to linger. They had to reach Mount Doom and destroy the One Ring before the impending war. This secret staircase was actually arranged by Gollum. He knew that the staircase would lead them through a tunnel where fear and death would await them. Gollum's ultimate goal was to reclaim the One Ring from Frodo, but Samwise remained highly vigilant throughout their journey. You listen to me. He listened good and proper. Anything happens to him, you have me to answer to. Along the way, Gollum Gollum whispers softly in front of Frodo to provoke their relationship. Gollum tells Frodo that Samwise is trying to steal the One Ring. During a rest break, Gollum crushed the remaining elven bread and scattered it on Samwise, then threw the rest down a cliff. When they woke up, Gollum accused Samwise of stealing all the provisions. By this time, Samwise had already guessed that Gollum was the one who was stirring up trouble. In a fit of pique, Samwise knocks Gollum Gollum to the ground and beats him up. Gollum continued to sow discord between Frodo and Samwise, making Frodo recall a statement Samwise had made earlier. I could carry it for a while. Frodo, 
Deceived by Gollum and compelled by the one ring in his body, drives Samwise back to Char in a fit of rage. Samwise left the expedition with tears in his eyes. Samwise realizes that Gollum has thrown his rations down the mountain. It's obvious that Gollum got rid of him on purpose and is going after Frodo next. As aggravated as he was, Samwise couldn't let his best mate be threatened. Samwise immediately turned around and chased after him. Gollum led Frodo to a dark and deep cave at the mountaintop. And here, Gollum's true intentions were revealed. He left Frodo alone in the cave, hiding nearby. Frodo was caught in Gollum's trap and a large spider came at him with its bloody mouth open. In his panic, he remembers the starlight that Galadriel gave him, a source of light that all the forces of darkness would be a little afraid of. Plus the sting that Bilbo gave him, Spider backed down a bit. During the chase, Frodo gets entangled in a spider's web and can't move. The cunning Gollum smiles in front of him, and the big spider follows behind him. At the critical moment, Frodo cuts the web with Sting and breaks free. Gollum, seeing an opportunity, lunged forward to steal the One Ring. In the ensuing struggle, Frodo managed to push Gollum away into the depths of the cave. With the cave's exit in sight, a giant spider slowly approached Frodo from behind. It pierced Frodo with a sharp stinger, causing him to foam at the mouth. The spider then wrapped Frodo in its web and carried him away. With Sauron's orcs pouring out of Barad-dûr, the invasion of Middle-earth was a foregone conclusion. A green light shot up from the main gate, obscuring the sky. Gandalf, who had noticed the sight from afar, immediately rode his white horse to the capital of Gondor to tell the king regent to prepare for war. This grand and majestic white city was named Minas Tirith. Built against the cliffs with colossal white stones, Gandalf ascended the layers of the city until he reached the very top. Outside the palace of Gondor, there stood a white tree, which had not blossomed for over a thousand years since the death of the king. Inside the palace, Regent Denethor is sitting on his throne, lost in his grief over the death of his eldest son, Boromir. Despite Gandalf's warnings that war was imminent, Denethor remained unmoved even angrily retorting that Gandalf had only come to Gondor for the benefit of Aragorn, Gondor's heir, and that he would not cede his power. Frustrated, Gandalf had no choice but to withdraw for the time being. Outside, a vast expanse of dark clouds covered the sky, a result of the dense smoke Sauron's forces had released before their march. Because Mordor's orcs feared sunlight, Sauron blocked out the sun to facilitate their march. As the dark clouds extended to Gondor, it signaled the imminent arrival of the great battle. With no time to waste, Gandalf immediately sent Pippin to stealthily climb a high tower and ignite a beacon for aid. The first beacon blazed into a roaring fire. Observing this, the guards at other mountain peaks lit their beacons one after another to convey the message of support. The beacons spread all the way to the borders of the Kingdom of Rohan, Aragorn. Upon witnessing this scene, quickly rushed to the council hall to report to the King of Rohan. The beacons are Minas City! The beacons are lit! Upon hearing the news, King Theoden hesitated for a few seconds but then immediately ordered the mobilization of his entire army to march towards Gondor, with the imperative of reaching the capital within three days. Meanwhile, Faramir was stationed at the border of Gondor, guarding a crucial fortress. The opposite bank appeared unusually quiet, indicating that the orc army was silently approaching. As expected, within the mist, the orc army advanced under the cover of night. An alert guard noticed them but was shot dead by an arrow before he could sound the alarm. Everyone, upon hearing the disturbance, immediately moved quietly to prepare for defense. The orc army began landing one by one. Faramir took the initiative to confront the advancing orcs. If the fortress fell, Gundor would be the next target, so they had to hold the line and await reinforcements. However, the enemy's numbers far exceeded Faramir's expectations. Orc legions had infiltrated the fortress through multiple routes. The encounter battle raged on throughout the night and was not successfully defended. It was evident that the orcs greatly outnumbered their forces. Faramir made the difficult decision to abandon the fortress and ordered everyone to withdraw to Minas Tirith. Before they could escape, they were ambushed by several ringwraiths. Horses can't fly as fast as ringwraiths. Most of the soldiers were taken away by ringwraiths on the way. And most of the soldiers were taken by ringwraiths on the way. Gandalf, the white wizard, rode in on his white horse and used his staff to fend off the ringwraiths. The soldiers quickly opened the city gates, allowing everyone to return to the safety of Minas Tirith. <laughs> 
Faramir received no consolation from his father. Upon learning that the fortress had fallen, Denethor erupted in anger, blaming Faramir for not holding the line and suggesting that Faramir should have died valiantly on the battlefield instead of retreating to the city. Tears welled up in Faramir's eyes as he was overwhelmed with sadness. In a desperate attempt to gain his father's approval, Faramir decides to return to the outskirts of the city with the remnants of his army to retake the lost fortress. Everyone knew deep down that almost no one would return alive. Over a hundred knights charged towards the enemy lines, but even before they clashed in combat, they were all brought down by a rain of orc arrows. Oh, Tens of thousands of orcs marched ominously towards the gates of Gundor, this time well equipped and with several engineering ladders pushed to the forefront of their assault. Minas Tirith, the white city of Gundor, built against the cliffs, was the most formidable human fortress, equipped with powerful defensive weapons. The battle commenced with Ents launching the first salvo using catapults. The humans responded in kind, the humans retaliated in kind with their own siege weapons, and in the initial exchange, neither side gained a decisive advantage. However, the orcs dispatched the nine ring wraiths into the air to launch a sudden assault on the humans, they swiftly destroyed some of the human siege weapons on the walls. Simultaneously, the guards on the walls were attacked by the ring wraiths, causing chaos among the defenders. Seeing the situation, Gandalf immediately rallied the troops boosting their morale and launching a counterattack. Using the catapults, they systematically demolished the engineering ladders brought forward by the orcs. Ringwraith kept circling in the air to harass and destroy the human engineering weapons one after another, which directly made the soldiers below the defending city fearful. Taking advantage of the confusion of the human army, Ensense pushed all the heavy siege ladders to the edge of the city wall. In the face of the arrow's attack Ents didn't have the slightest intention of retreating. The siege ladders carried a large number of orcs onto the walls. I didn't expect the orcs to challenge the human defense at the beginning of the battle. Even a wave of orcs with siege hammers attacked the city gates. But the White City was the most defensive fortress of the humans in Middle-earth. So naturally the gates wouldn't be easily breached by the enemy. This wave of orcs were harvested by the archers on the city wall. When the orcs leader saw this, he immediately called for a halt and changed the plan. Let the Ents wolf's head ram, the killing weapon of the orcs. All the orcs raised their arms and cheered. The wolf's head ram was quickly pushed to the front of the gate amidst huge cheers of encouragement. Five Ents pulling hard on the ropes they began to smash into the gate. It was only a matter of time before the devastating hammers broke through the walls. Gandalf quickly ordered the frontline troops to fall back and defend the city gates. The battle had transitioned from dusk into night. The gates were finally breached by the orcs under the constant pounding. The overwhelming presence of the orcs began to demoralize the defenders, and fear started to creep in. Four trolls, wielding maces and heavily armored, charged into the city, compounding the dire situation. The orc legions swarmed like a tide, and the humans had no choice but to fight a rearguard action while retreating. Gandalf, wielding his staff, joined the melee. They fought fiercely through the night, and many civilian houses were set ablaze. The casualties among the elderly, women, and children were devastating with the sounds of their lamentations echoing throughout the castle. However, not a single soldier wavered. As long as they drew breath, they were determined to defend their families and their city. Gandalf and Pippin were intercepted on the walls by Ringwraith. A Ringwraith drew its Morgul blade and emitted a chilling wail, shattering Gandalf's staff. At the critical moment when the Ringwraith was about to strike, a distant horn signaled the arrival of reinforcements. The Ringwraith swiftly changed direction and mounted the fell beast. Flying towards the front lines, countless cavalry reinforcements arrived on the battlefield, having traveled tirelessly for three days. King Theoden of Rohan gazed upon the overwhelming orc force on the brink of the city. The orcs were so dense that all the cavalry were scared even before they entered the battlefield. The leader of the orcs immediately ordered them to turn around and prepare for battle, but Rohan's cavalry would not back down out of fear. The hard men on horseback would only fall in the way of the charge. Before the soldiers of Rohan charged into the battle, Theoden delivered an impassioned speech, rallying their spirits. Yeah! 
At King Theoden's command, Rohan's cavalry poured into the enemy with the sound of the charge horn. Although the Rohan knights were not as numerous as the enemy, Orcs was frightened by the pressure of the strong charge. Bathed in blood, Rohan's knights fought valiantly, crushing countless orcs and turning the tide of battle, they were determined to annihilate the forces of darkness. In a matter of moments, orcs discarded their armor and scattered, fleeing in all directions. Upon seeing the situation, King Theoden immediately ordered to drive the orcs towards the river, cornering them to a desperate situation. And at the crucial moment of pursuing the orcs, the ground suddenly trembled slightly, interrupting the rhythm of the battlefield assault. All eyes turned to a distant point on the battlefield. Suddenly, mercenaries from various quarters joined the fray. A formidable southern barbarian legion known as the Mammoth Corps, facing this new formidable adversary, Roland's warriors remained undaunted. They swiftly changed formation and prepared to confront the threat. With a thunderous roar, the mammoths charged towards the line. Rohan's cavalry, too, sounded their charge. Rohan's battle-hardened warriors, displaying unwavering bravery, clashed with the mammoths. However, the humans were like ants before the immense might of the elephants, easily swept aside by their colossal tusks. The thick-skinned and robust mammoths made it impossible for the Rohan cavalry to find a way to attack. The mercenaries atop the mammoths wreaked havoc among the human defenders, resulting in devastating casualties and leaving the humans seemingly defenseless. The mammoth pulls on the steel spikes, killing the charging warriors one by one. Rohan's experienced generals quickly identified a breakthrough strategy. If they could take down the controllers atop the mammoths, it would disrupt their rhythm and halt their advance. Mammoths soon stumbled and collided with one another as the controllers were eliminated, rendering them ineffective. The remaining humans focused on targeting their adversaries' fatal weaknesses. <laughs> Suddenly, a fell beast, ridden by a ring wraith, descended and carried King Theoden away from his horse. A generation of heroes has fallen just like that. Without a leader, the warriors had to retreat a hundred meters. Suddenly a little soldier bravely stepped forward. She was determined to protect King Theoden's remains. The soldier cut off fell beast's head without fear. The witch king of Anmar stood in front of the pawn with his meteor hammer and smashed his shield with a single blow. A hand on the throat of the rope lifted the pawn high in the air and said, Die now. Just in the nick of time Pippin attacked Witch King of Anmar from behind and freed the pawn from his bonds. The pawn took off his helmet and said, I am no man. The Witch King of Anmar, never expecting her to be a woman, was directly corroded by her sword, disintegrating his body. Nonetheless, the odds still favored the Orsish legions. Orcs forced to the riverbank finally saw their salvation as pirate reinforcements arrived. As the orcs angrily berated the tardy pirates, Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli leaped from their ship. The sight of this trio struck terror into the hearts of all orcs. Aragorn, wielding the Andural sword, commanded an army of a hundred thousand undead warriors. The horrific undead were incorporeal and even invulnerable. They ignored the terrain and physical damage and trampled the charging orcs. Aragorn claimed the head of the orc leader, further disheartening the enemy. Facing the charging mammoths, Legolas displayed exceptional agility. He leaped onto the tusks of the mammoths and swiftly climbed to the top. In a short span, he systematically eliminated the controllers. Legolas then grabbed a piece of twine hanging from the middle of Mammoth's stomach and cut the rope with a single slash. The unbalanced elephant's saddle quickly fell to the other side. Legolas ran to the top of Mammoth's head and fired three arrows on Mammoth's canopy. The pain was so intense that Mammoth fell down with a thud. Legolas gracefully landed on the ground, following the nose of the Mammoth. Aragorn, wielding the Andural sword, swiftly dispatched hundreds of orcs. The Legion of the Dead following behind, swiftly cleared the battlefield of all remaining foes. Inside the White City, orcs still pressed on towards the Citadel's throne room. The last remaining defenders at the main gate held their ground as the final line of defense. But soon, the Legion of the Dead surged up the fortress, defeating all the orcs within. As the dark clouds slowly dispersed, it signaled a comprehensive victory in the defense. However, this victory came at the cost of countless lives. After the war's end, Aragorn fulfilled his promise and released all the undead. They ascended with the breeze, dissipating along with the smoke of battle, finding peace at last. On Frodo's side, he was ensnared by the thousand-year-old giant spider, wrapped in spider silk. When the spider was about to take Frodo away for a meal, Samwise came to Frodo's rescue with his starlight and sword in hand. Samwise courageously fought the giant spider, 
A diminutive hobbit facing a monstrous adversary, despite the fear within him, Samwise never flinched. Protecting Frodo was not just Samwise's duty, it showcased the profound friendship between them. He was willing to give his life to save his dear friend. Samwise's relentless spirit finally pushes the spider back. With unwavering determination, Samwise managed to drive the spider back. And when he tore away the sticky webbing from Frodo, he found Frodo pale and lifeless. Tears welled up in Samwise's eyes as he held Frodo, teetering on the brink of despair. Not only did he lose a good brother, but it also meant that the expedition's mission had failed. Suddenly, Sting, on the ground, emitted a blue glow, signaling the approach of danger. Samwise couldn't think of anything else to do but to hide. A group of goblins, alerted by the noise, arrived at the cave to investigate. They discovered the prone body and murmured that Frodo was still alive but had succumbed to the spider's venom, rendering him unconscious. Samwise, concealed in the shadows, heard this and glimpsed a ray of hope. To make sure the meat tasted good, the goblins carried Frodo to the tower to be cleaned. Samwise followed them and entered the tower without a hitch. Frodo was stripped of all his clothes. The two goblins fought over the mithril armor. Frodo realized that the one ring he was wearing had also been taken. Suddenly the two goblins fought over the mithril armor, causing an infighting. <laughs> Samwise took this opportunity to enter the tower and made his way to Frodo's cell. Along the way, he confronted three orc guards, using Sting to defeat them. Like a stuck pig. Not if I stick you first. Sam! Frodo immediately apologizes for questioning Samwise's behavior, and a panicked Frodo tells him that the One Ring has been taken by the orcs. Samwise, calm and composed, retrieved the One Ring from his pocket. When they had encountered the goblins earlier, Samwise had temporarily kept it for safety reasons. When Frodo asked him to return the One Ring, Samwise hesitated for a few seconds and seemed to be tempted by the One Ring. But soon, Samwise overcame the temptation and returned the One Ring to Frodo. They donned the orc's armor and escaped the tower. Mount Dune was within their reach, but the path was infested with countless orc legions. And with the Eye of Sauron watching every corner of the tower, it's going to be extremely difficult to infiltrate Mordor and get to Mount Doom. They cunningly disguised themselves as they blended into the orcs' ranks, hoping to pass through Mordor unnoticed. At this point, Sauron's orc armies were still assembling, preparing to march on Gondor. The orcs were afraid of the sun, so they used a dark cloud to block out all light. They trailed the orc horde throughout the night. Frodo's frail body couldn't withstand the exertion, and the closer they got to the volcano, the deeper the One Ring's corruption gnawed at him. The leader of their escort was about to inspect their group. To avoid detection, Samwise and Frodo staged a fight, creating chaos among the orcs. Seizing the opportunity amidst the turmoil, they slipped away from the marching column. The victory in Gundor was complete, but Frodo and Samwise remained in dire peril as they journeyed forward. After careful consideration and unanimous agreement, they decided they needed to create a diversion to draw Mordor's attention away, buying Frodo and Samwise more time and a better chance to reach Mount Doom. Aragorn took decisive action, using a crystal ball to establish contact with Sauron and wielding the Sacred Sword of Anduril in an open challenge to Sauron. He declared himself as Aragorn, the 39th descendant of Isildur, and formally declared war against Sauron. With a remnant of his forces, Aragorn once again set out from the White City towards Mordor. After enduring a relentless journey, they finally arrived at the gates of Mordor. Mordor dispatched a chieftain for negotiations, even showing them the mithril armor as proof that they had captured Frodo. The king a broken elvish play. <laughs> Aragorn would not believe their lies. As the gates of Mordor slowly swung open, a tide of a hundred thousand orcs poured forth. Go back! Rohan's 5,000 knights are surrounded by the orcs. Aragorn stepped forward to rally and inspire the troops with a pre-battle speech. I bid you stand! Men of the West! As more and more orcs joined the battlefield, both sides readied themselves for the imminent clash, waiting for the charge signal. Aragorn looked back at his comrades, uttering just one phrase, for Frodo, with his sword held high. He charged into the enemy ranks, and the rest of the soldiers followed, raising their voices in a battle cry. 
This decisive battle was not only about buying time for Frodo but also about fighting for the peace of Middle-earth. As the battle began, the orcs sent fell beasts for an aerial assault. Gandalf, in response, began chanting incantations and summoned the giant eagles from the Misty Mountains. In no time, the eagles drove all the fell beasts away, forcing them to retreat to Mordor. At this point, all of them are tired and in a bitter struggle. Orcs even sent their armored ants and trolls to join the battlefield. It was a battle with seemingly no chance of victory, but the soldiers were willing to sacrifice their lives if it meant gaining even a moment for Frodo and Samwise. Unknown to them, their valiant efforts provided a distraction, allowing Frodo and Samwise to elude Sauron's watchful eye. Mount Doom's entrance was just a step away, but their bodies could no longer withstand the heat of the volcano. Frodo has been severely affected by the One Ring, and his body is completely exhausted and weakened. Samwise picked up Frodo with tears in his eyes and encouraged him to persevere. At this critical moment, Samwise, acting as the best support, made a decisive move that completely broke my defense. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you! Come on! Samwise used his tired body to carry Frodo on his shoulders. His eyes were red and he walked towards the entrance of the volcano step by step with his indomitable spirit. The Lord of the Rings may not have Frodo, but it can't have Samwise. However, as they neared the entrance, Gollum, who had coveted the One Ring all along, suddenly attacked from behind. Gollum chokes Frodo with one hand and starts to grab the One Ring. Samwise attacked Gollum with a rock to free himself. They then tangle and roll down the ramp. The cunning Gollum bites Samwise's shoulder with his sharp teeth. Frodo took advantage of this moment and stepped alone into the entrance of Mount Doom. Samwise followed closely behind Frodo and implored him urgently to cast the One Ring into the fiery abyss. As long as the One Ring is cast into the churning lava below, all the crises in Middle-earth can be exchanged for peace. Throw it in the fire! At the critical moment, Frodo's body and consciousness could not resist the temptation of the One Ring. Just as the final moment arrived, Frodo put on the One Ring and vanished before Samwise's eyes. Gollum, who had been consumed by an insatiable desire for the One Ring, also arrived at this spot. He eagerly followed Frodo's footsteps and leaped upon him, frantically attempting to seize the One Ring, until Frodo's finger was bitten off by Gollum. His body gradually became visible. In the end, Gollum managed to reclaim the One Ring, and he celebrated with jubilation, clutching it to his chest and muttering to himself. Frodo rushes forward to grab the One Ring again, and the two of them wrestle and fall off the cliff. Gollum clutched the One Ring to his chest and fell into the searing hot lava. The One Ring was finally utterly destroyed. Fortunately, Frodo managed to cling to a rock at the edge of the cliff, and Samwise caught up, hastily pulling him back to safety on the shore. Meanwhile, Aragorn and the remaining soldiers continued to fight valiantly. Suddenly, in the distance, a tremendous rumbling indicated that Mount Doom was about to erupt. Sauron's eye, atop its dark tower, collapsed with a deafening crash. Witnessing this spectacle, everyone knew that Frodo had succeeded. As Sauron's eye fell, Mordor began to crumble, and the orc armies scattered in panic. Mount Doom erupted in a massive explosion, and shockwaves spread throughout Mordor. Even the ringwraiths, in the air, were struck by fireballs. Frodo and Samwise narrowly escaped the erupting volcano. But the path beneath their feet was covered by molten lava, just when it seemed they had no way out. Gandalf, riding atop a giant eagle, arrived at the volcano to rescue them. Frodo and Samwise were taken to Rivendell for their much-needed recovery. Aragorn returned to Gondor and ascended to the throne as its king, as he was crowned and adorned with the royal crown. The white tree, which had not borne fruit for over a thousand years, suddenly blossomed with petals. Finally, the ring bearers, Bilbo and Frodo, departed on a swan ship with Galadriel. They received a reward from the Vala and sailed to Amon. The Lord of the Rings trilogy concludes at this point. Next, I will continue to share new stories with you.